Hi, friends. Welcome, everybody. What do you think, Michael? Should we get going? Let's do it. So welcome, everybody. Um, this is kind of a historic day for me and Michael. Uh, we've been on this path before COVID, before Trump, and before the birth of his son and my granddaughter. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's been quite a saga of history in those few years. And there's Taylor. And so it's a really um, evocative time for me, Michael. I've so much valued our long journey on both our accounts. And uh, you've done such courageous work surviving <laughs> up till now. I really congratulate you on really surviving this very rough period and getting here. That's a great thing to celebrate that you made it to this point. And I want everybody to know it was definitely not easy that you took a lot of guts and courage. And so I congratulate you in being here today doing this. So uh, for those of you who are uh, visiting, uh, Michael's going to kind of summarize his work for a half hour. And then uh, Janine and Michelle and I will offer him a little challenge, a question or two, and then I'll be open to all of you. So Michael, there you go. Okay, we're gonna try the screen share again. Fingers crossed, huh? How's that? Perfect. Looks Perfect. good. Great. Okay. Most of you know, um, my name is Michael Lynn Wellman. Uh, the topic today, uh, title of my dissertation was Rewilding Activism. Uh, it was about weaving a resistance, reskilling, and remembering. Um, because of Zoom and COVID and all these different challenges we have these days, I'm um, like most of us, maybe coming in from remote. Uh, I'm here on occupied uh, Nishinaabe lands, uh, shores of Gishigami, which is uh, also known as Lake Superior and the upper peninsula of Michigan. And uh, fitting, as I was telling Don, is uh, we're in the midst of our first winter storm advisory. So as I was walking here today, I was sleeting on me and uh, record wave potential today on Lake Superior and just a very wild, fierce day out there. So. I chose to walk to experience it. Um, so we're gonna go through this, uh, an overview of the dissertation. Uh, the first slides are gonna be the um, front loaded and, and the majority of the material. Uh, I'm gonna try to take about a half hour or so to do this um, talk. And then um, we'll open it up for conversation and uh, Q&A. So to start with orientation. Um, and this is really about like situating myself, situating myself within uh, what's happening with the earth and our sociological systems right now. Um, and, and one of the things that was really a struggle for me uh, to work out with Don was how to situate myself and my familial upbringing within the larger work that I was doing. And, and this was a bit edgy for me um, at the beginning of how to write my familial story as growing up in a, a blue collared uh, General Motors family in, in Flint, Michigan, uh, during a time of uh, outsourcing NAFTA uh, and really uh, the collapse of an industrial town um, that included my, my father, uh, plant closing and him moving to Texas and and all sorts of unravelings. Um, and what I found, uh, hey, hey Michael, um, yeah, can I interrupt you for a second? I'm not yeah. sure if we're if we're seeing we're seeing a beautiful image. Um, is this your the image that you're wanting to, us to see, or is there a PowerPoint slide? Oh, is it not on my PowerPoint? We're seeing an image of um, like a. No, I think we're seeing a background image right now. Are you seeing Mark Henson's work? Are you seeing it now? Yes, yes, it's there. You are, there you it are is. seeing the presentation. That's it. There you go. Hey, hey. <laughs> oh my we'll god, it's here. 
Okay, well, maybe we can move from here then. Well, we need to get you now, Michael. You're not, your uh, video must be off. Ah, yes, of course. Ah, now it's all there. Well, perfect. <laughs> Whew. Take a moment to come back in. <laughs> uh, okay. So where I was in the presentation when I started speaking to all that, I mean, that, that gentleman at the precipice between the two worlds, I guess, is fitting. Um, and so um, situating myself when I was mentioning the work with Don and my upbringing and this work around movements, um, I really came to uh, very late in this as I was, I was finishing it up was uh, the work of the Zapatistas and uh, what that represented with uh, NAFTA as well and, and the urge towards globalization and their response to it. And I, I told a story kind of like linear between what that spawned and, um, and my own life story. And, and the rise of movements. And uh, the slogan from the Zapatistas was another world is possible. And uh, it really represented two things. One in their uh, January 1st, 1994 uh, uprising um, was a different model of uprising and not trying to seize state power, but be outside of state power. Um, uh, and that was really what's been now known as like Zapatismo or um, spawning this new movement. Uh, but David Graeber and our own Andre Grubacek uh, would call like the movement of movements. And um, with that is kind of this identification of um, small a anarchism and, and all these principles of uh, non-hierarchy, decentralization, grassroots organizing, network models, uh, mutual aid, solidarity, not charity, uh, and especially that the uh, ends do not justify um, the means. And so uh, decoupling the violent revolution of the past and something Don and I had talked a lot about with that, um, just the nastiness, the dehumanization, uh, that happens and, and violent as their revolutions that revolving and, and recreating the same conditions as before. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm placing this inside of is the movement of movements. And, and when I started this project a couple of months after being at CIS, uh, the Ferguson uprising and the start of a, what's now known as the Black Lives Matter movement, um, the current iteration of Black Liberation and I happened to be in the streets of Oakland for that uprising. And uh, it was really my first time just being marching in large movements in a big city and experiencing uh, the response of the police state and, and witnessing these waves over the course of my own dissertation with uh, Standing Rock and, and all that Standing Rock represented to climate justice and the anti-pipeline and extractivism movements. And, um, indigenous sovereignty and land back. And really the closure, the bookend of um, this, having a small child and being in a different place uh, was the George Floyd uprising that took place in the early days of the pandemic. And so really trying to situate myself within this movement of movements that was spawned um, through the Zapatista uprising. And so I, I try to do that through weaving and connecting stories and connecting different movements. Uh, and I see that really being the role that I'm taking on in this project. And then I also situated myself within uh, collapse, uh, collapse awareness. Um, the idea that our, our systems are collapsing ecologically and socially and um, the psychological, psychosomatic and emotional uh, spiritual existential ramifications of the awareness of coming into that recognition uh, around the same time as that Oakland uprising. For me, I connected that the social and ecological crises were uh, one and the same. And so needing to expand my own purview of uh, the situation and focus less on climate or uh, ecological environmental issues 
and seeing really how big it was really spun me out into um, what well, one, one term for this has been called the black pill of doomism. And um, my own struggles with ecological grief and uh, dissociation, the panic and paralysis, despair, um, and recognizing how this has really uh, taken over the youth of today. Some recent studies that came out during the pandemic, I feel like really highlight this. Uh, one of them said it was like the largest study that's ever been done around climate change in youth is 50% of youth consider that humanity is doomed. Um, another one of like US youth was like over 20% of US youth considered uh, suicide, killing themselves during the pandemic. And, um, and so if we're, we're gonna move beyond like the doomism and, and have uh, possibilities of a, another world, then we need to really grapple with this reality. And, and for me, I, I kind of explore some of the, what I kind of came to know as collapsed trauma. Um, my work with Joanna Macy called it ecological grief, solastalgia is another term, environmental melancholy. People are really trying to grapple with this. And um, I think one of the recognitions is that it's, it presents like PTSD, but that it's like pre-traumatic in a way for some peoples and that it's a disordering that it's continuing to get more pervasive, more amplified and accelerate. And so um, it really, I, I centered it in my work because of my own struggle with it. And also one of the reasons why Joanna Macy's model really came in for me was uh, in those first couple of years while I was struggling with this as a CIS, I had the opportunity to take a great turning class with her, um, as well as do a 10 day work that reconnects retreat. Um, and Joanna holds a lot of exercises and practices that are held in community and relationship on how to be very honest and open, intimate and vulnerable around these uh, issues that are, are not really discussed or are often denied or gaslit and, and to give us the space to, to grieve with these hard truths, to express our anger, to feel our emptiness. Um, and so to Joanna, and I, I believe I saw, I don't know, and, and all of this, I believe I saw that she's here today. So hello, Joanna, thank you so much. I really, I'm just so grateful that I'm able to put this work out in the world and that you're able to see it because um, you've meant so much to me. Uh, and Joanna in her work for, um, is really kind of how I, I framed and, and built the model for my dissertation. She talks about three stories of our time. Uh, and the one that for, the importance here is the great turning model, which I believe is about um, this another world is possible idea and leaning into this and how do we turn towards a life um, affirming society. And inside of that model, she had three pillars, um, one about alternative systems, one about shifting consciousness and one about holding actions. And the movements I chose to work with, I feel like each fit inside of one of those um, resistance, our social and ecological resistance would be holding actions. Um, Reskilling and land-based life ways would be building alternative systems and our, our remembering or healing or coming back to wholeness would be about uh, shifting our consciousness. And so for me and the weaving, I, I placed these movements in conversation with each other and really looked at the intersection of these movements and how these movements can help benefit each other uh, towards this uh, idea of another world being possible. And then finally, my methodology, uh, I use a, a form of ethnography known as militant ethnography that came out of the anti-globalization movement, which also spawned out of the Zapatismo. And it's really about um, an embodied way of knowing through being immersed in the movements on the front lines by attending direct actions, being involved in meetings, cooking in camp kitchens, uh, being an observant participant and, and giving back to the movements. And, and so through that, I did a bit of story making and, and tried to really tell stories at the intersections of the campaigns and the gatherings, the ceremonies, and um, my experience of being on these front lines. Uh, and all, I think I'd done like 12 frontline campaigns, like 
11 convergences and gatherings and about 15 ceremonies. So I really made it the immersion of my life for several years, about a four year window. Um, and what emerged out of that, the emergent property was really this another movement that also spawns out of uh, the movement of movements was the human rewilding movement. And so I feel like this is also really fitting that this is what I found because uh, human rewilding movement and rewilding in general emerges out of the earth first movement. Um, and so with my interest in the water protection and land defense campaigns and the radical ecological movements um, kind of co-spawned uh, conservation rewilding, um, which today recently Dave Foreman, one of the co-founders of Earth First and someone who really put conservation rewilding on the map, uh, passed away a couple weeks ago, and it feels really fitting that uh, just timing-wise for this work to come out around him. At the same time, there was a split with the human rewilding movement, which in addition to the uh, cores, corridors, and carnivores of conservation rewilding, acknowledged that humans as animals uh, really were meant to be part of any sort of rewilding project. Uh, through a lens of land-based traditional societies and our roles in tending the wild. And um, so the human rewilding movement really encapsulates that. And I just briefly touch on a few um, aspects of how I define wildness and, and wilderness and juxtaposition to coming out of the idea of civilization and domestication versus rewilding. Um, and we can really get into the weeds there. My own experiences in the backcountry as a outdoor adventure, as a outdoor leadership development and backcountry guiding and having experiences, a, a avalanche country, being in the backcountry, getting carried in avalanche, having a near drowning whitewater rafting, um, running into like a rattlesnake den, climbing, really um, bring the wildness out of the theoretical and into the real. And I, I try to bring that forward in this work. And one thing to note there in the image on the right, the blue is a study that was done 10,000 years ago, pre kind of the adaptation of worldwide agriculture of wild animals in the world. And the little sliver is humans, which also could be considered, you know, wild animals. And the lower image, uh, the little blue sliver is, is the percentage of wild mammals that are left today and the rest being humans and livestock. And so I think it really encapsulates what conservation rewilding and, and human rewilding are getting at in, in the face of the sixth extinction. Um, and at the root of this is uh, immediate versus delayed return economies, uh, economy being management of the home and a, a term coming out of uh, my, again, my time in guiding and the wilderness first responder course is the rules of threes. And that teaches us we have three minutes we can go without air, three hours without shelter, three days without water, and three weeks without food. Uh, people generally are pretty surprised about how long we can go without food, but at the end of the day, we have to have food, and, and that means uh, taking the life of other beings, whether that's plant or mushroom or animals, and, and I feel like a lot of what emerges, the religions and philosophies, theologies, is grappling with that reality that we have to take other life to survive. And so the immediate return versus delayed return, nature versus societies, as, as we moved away from immediate return economies around gathering, hunting, scavenging, foraging, um, horticulture, gardening, to our more delayed return with food storage, food surplus, um, more monoculture as we've seen it today with big agriculture, as that our psychologies, our meaning making um, uh, have to start being delayed. And this is really interesting work I found from a gentleman named Leonard Martin, a uh, psychology, behavioral science, uh, brain science professor, and his ID compensation theory. And it looks like the farther we get away from the environment in which we evolutionary adapted and our immediate return ways of gathering food, the more we've had to make meaning making in our societies. Um, and so ultimately, one of the main proponents of rewilding is returning to our senses, returning to ourselves, and coming home to a world we never stop belonging to. 
I really see it as being a project of uh, re-embodiment and uh, returning to being a body on the body of the earth, this e uh, eco-somatics field. And then finally, I would just say that the work that I was doing is if rewilding is an embodied primal anarchy or green anarchy and ancestral ancestral skills gatherings that I attended are the gateway to rewilding, I was kind of somewhere in the middle um, in the realm of praxis of taking practice and trying to develop new theories uh, and uh, really making a note here of low theory. Uh, this comes from David Graeber as well, of not some capital T high theory, but um, what works for me, um, what I found as one small T truth amongst many truths. And so that's really the heavy, heavy part of this presentation, really getting into the philosophies, the theories, what I developed. Um, very briefly, I'll try to go through the three chapters. I looked at the three intersections of these three movements and how they can benefit each other. I had one on resistance and reskilling, one on resistance and remembering, and one on reskilling and remembering. And so each one I got into, I started with an intention of where the movements are currently at in the intersection. And then I looked at, on both sides of how one movement could benefit the other movement. And then finally, I did an, an integration, which would be a future work of where we could potentially go from here. Um, what I found at the intersection of reskilling and resistance is that there's a lot of people within land defense, water protection, earth firsters, and the such who are already doing a lot of reskilling. Places like the rendezvous had classes on plant walks and plant identification or, or rope making. Um, and that the resistance is really a core part of rewilding within uh, the primal anarchy milieu. But that often in these gatherings and the ancestral guards gatherings and stuff, there's a bubble of privilege and that we really need to claim the inherent politics of what we're doing when we're reskilling in land-based life ways. And that, that tends to be one of the biggest things that's lacking right now. Um, and then for each of these chapters, I looked at a land-based life way, a land-based skill um, through the lens of a, a campaign or movement. Um, and I'm not gonna go into each one. There's just way too much to cover. Um, but I tried to pull out uh, like a skill that I felt was really important and relevant. Um, the ones here with pattern literacy, navigation, and animal processing um, within how those could help improve our resistance movements. And then on the flip side, I looked at uh, bird language, stargazing, and acorn processing, uh, and the role that resistance could play in helping us deep into those life ways. Um, and so each one of these was me practicing a skill. Over here on the right, um, we can see uh, there's me and, and a good friend of mine from CIS uh, uh, doing our permaculture design course at the Occidental Art and Ecology Center uh, north of the Bay in Pomo Lands. And that's the first time I started fire by friction with a hand drill. And, and it's so hard to capture in the story, just all the feelings and everything that went through that process of the blisters on the hands and the hands bleeding to really trying to keep the coal alive to what it meant to actually start fire and the empowerment of that process. And then future work. Um, I did a play on uh, Winona LaDuke's work. I, I had the chance to work with her a bit at the Stop Line 5 or Stop Line 3 um, campaign as well as hear her talk a couple other times. And this idea of garden and gardening, this uh, immediate return, uh, way of managing our food, how we can tend the wild, use traditional ecological knowledge, indigenous land management practices, permaculture, agroecology, to start feeding our movements. Um, one of the big takeaways was just how terrible the food is that people on the front lines who are in our land defense and water protection campaigns and, and how these people are like, how we need to um, be nourished on a very basic level to be able to stay grounded and what we're fighting for. And the image down here is one of the many campaigns where uh, the land defense campaign, uh, this one is against the Bayou Pipeline, have, 
have manifested or evolved into building food forests. Uh, and this is one of the places I see a lot of ins inspiration moving forward is that movements and campaigns, encampments, autonomous zones are starting to really get into uh, building food, making their own medicine, starting to reclaim those lifeways while they're defending space. And, and that's really what I was trying to get at with this chapter and my work uh, is how we can start merging these so that they're, they're not different movements, but one and the same. Um, the next chapter, uh, I have a, over here an image from one of the first, the very first campaigns I visited was uh, the tar sands mining in the Utah Canyon country. Not many people know that there's tar sands mining happening here in Turtle Island and in the United States of America, as we call it, so-called. Um, and, and the hostility that was there was so miserable, so the infighting, the factionalism that a large contingent of people left before the action. And, and even though the action still happened, uh, the question was really like, at what cost? Um, and so I really looked at various aspects of the role of remembering, of healing, of trauma-informed activism uh, and, and grappling with the trauma of people on the front lines. Um, and that's really what this chapter is about is looking at how people who come from backgrounds of uh, trauma and abuse tend to gravitate towards stopping the earth, often even projecting their own traumas onto extractivism. And so there, there comes like a lot of infighting and factionalism. Uh, there's a recent book called Joyful Militancy, another one, Pleasure Activism, that are really trying to get at this standpoint of the divide and conquer mentality that's inside of our movements. And how do we start coming into a place of, of working together, of having power with and, and grappling with healing our traumas, which is part of this work of resistance. Um, and the same was true of my experience uh, on the other side with like the run for salmon, a, a prayer walk that goes from the Bay Area all the way up to Mount Shasta and dealing with difficult questions like what does it mean to have a sacred masculinity in, um, campaigns where they tend to be very patriarchal or machoism, militarism, uh, and how do we balance these uh, forces for good um, to heal our own movements, let alone what we're trying to stop in the face of extractivism. And then I finished with one essay on the George Floyd uprising to really close out everything that I did. Um, it felt like a really important bookend to end with the black liberation again because that's where it started, even though the majority of my frontline experience was in rural land-based uh, anti-extractivism. And then the main point for future work, there's an image you know, most people know from the January 6th um, storming of the Capitol. Uh, Conspirituality, this concept of merging of like left-wing healing progressivism with uh, conspiracy theory. Um, and we, this is maybe an image we think of when we think of conspirituality, but here in my own town, our local wellness center, uh, just recognizing the way that this can happen within our healing communities and side of friends and, and family and stuff and really grappling with that, where here we had our, our main wellness center was not only anti-vaxxers, but also anti-maskers. And so what does it mean for us to have that lowest common denominator of taking care of the people within our community who are at the most risk, um, generally our marginalized and oppressed uh, communities, um, those immunocompromised, disabled, um, black and brown bodies. Uh, and so really grappling, grappling with this within inside of our own movements and not projecting it or externalizing it to the quote unquote enemy. And then the final chapter was really a conclusionary chapter. There's an image of my little one harvesting chanterelle mushrooms. Uh, they're maybe like 14 months there. Um, it was a really beautiful experience I write about in the dissertation. Um, and then for me, it's really grappling with like 
one that this rewilding all that i was talking about in the last chapter is, is really a healing process it's healing our relationship to the land healing a relationship to our own bodies healing a relationship to our communities um, and so i explore the progression of my own process and recognizing how much can be accomplished in such a short amount of time but also the systemic barriers that make it very difficult for the large majority of people who can't diff, um, dedicate their entire life way to this project and, and how many challenges we actually face. And so one of our local Anishinaabeg scholars here at the local university, Northern Michigan, uh, talks about this seventh generation plan and seventh generation concept, uh, pretty common in, in modern indigenous worldview. But I really started looking at, well, what does it mean for me to be like a transitionary generation and give my child all the opportunities I didn't have? And it's amazing at three years old, like they can identify wintergreen berries and blueberries and acorns and, and just how much our little ones can um, learn and absorb if they're given those opportunities. And so for me, I get really curious about the role of uh, pedagogy and parenting as we move forward um, towards rebuilding this um, class of wisdom holders, of elders who, who have this knowledge and land-based life ways, and how we can do that over recognizing that this is a multi-generational project and the same way that we have some intergenerational trauma, we can have intergenerational wisdom. And I look at some of the long-term practices um, that we can do to start building that inside of ourselves to stay present here in the now, um, to stay in our bodies, to start teaching these skills, stuff like some a, a practice as simple as cis spotting. Uh, this was part of one of my classes and I honestly could have read it, wrote an entire chapter or uh, potentially an entire dissertation on the juiciness that just came out of that semester long journal. Um, and something as simple as just sitting in the same spot every day and paying attention to the world around us and how much we can learn and how much we can come into relationship with our place through a, a, like a practice like that. And so each of these practices really focused on, on how we can develop those skills. Um, on the other side of the chapter, I looked at like our inner child, which is a big part of healing work, uh, our truncated adolescent rite of passages and completing those. Um, for me, this one's around hunting and it's uh, very similar to the work done by Chantal Forbes, the ESR PhD recently graduated with her dissertation on becoming animal and the hunt um, as a process of rite of passage. And then grief and grief work. I touched on grief at the beginning and coming back to grief again and just the role of grief and the importance of that as we're going through all we're losing in this world. And then finally, I try to finish with a um, rewilding futurism. There's a lot these days around climate fiction, uh, ecotopia, solar punks, lunar punks. Um, and so I try to do my own spin on this as well. Um, because of uh, the one of the big takeaways outside of the need for resistance when I was doing my coursework was the failure of imagination and, and this role of really fantasizing about what another world could actually look like so that we can create and make this possible. Uh, fantastophobia is a word from a CIS professor, Craig Chalquist, and, and are just our fear of fantasy these days. And so I felt like it was really important to play some futurism in there to just spawn some ideas again in that low theory realm, really asking other people to build on that, to create their own futures so that we can inspire each other moving forward. And then finally, I have an image here of caudal wampling. Uh, this is a great term. And one person said it was like the essence of rewilding. And so as we do the seventh generation plan and kind of move towards this, um, about traveling purposely towards this as yet unknown destination. And so I don't pretend to have any answers. I, I feel like I've, I'm leaving this with more questions than I went in with and I'm being very humbled by the process, but also like 
traveling purposely and kadiwampling as we learn these skills and, and practice this. And then finally, in closing, and my epilogue, um, I really grappled, grappled with accelerationism as a concept in a world, like the great acceleration that's happening around us. And with the land that I'm, I'm working right now with Minding, um, that was logged really heavily like 25 years ago, my role being an accelerationist and helping ecological secession accelerate towards an old growth community again, and, and just how challenging that can be. And also the work I've done with ceremony and healing and expanded states of consciousness also being um, another realm of accelerationism. And is it just how challenging this can be to claim accelerationism at the same time we have all this uh, right-wing accelerationism that's going towards this like white Christian nationalism and this alt-right paramilitarism uh, and this drive towards eco-fascism and just what a dangerous line that is and and really just needing to accelerate our systems of dual power about creating our systems of mutual aid our, our systems of solidarity uh, about our ability to uh, be able to operate outside of the state um, as our systems are collapsing it's also important for me as a returning to my lane i don't know if some people know this concept of staying in your lane um, just grappling with identity, coming back to like, for me, the most important thing moving forward as these uh, identities of father and my little one and raising them. Um, my role as a husband, my wife who's very supportive of this project uh, and practicing what I'm preaching and continuing to deepen in with my own skills, can, this own applied rewilding and my praxis. For me, that means to get back to do what I was doing before. Um, I recently found this photo of my father, which I just love because it's one of the, the biggest smiles I've ever seen on my father's face. And he never really had a chance to ski much, but here's a photo of him skiing. And that's one thing that I fell in love with before coming back to this project um, was my time in Utah and out west and adventuring in the backcountry. Uh, and my little one's already a skier um, and they just love it so much. And so Finding whatever is joy making for each of us, you know, I mentioned before about the joyful militancy, but um, in this time of just all this unraveling, um, all this collapse, really important for us to find joy amidst all the grief. And so finding what for each of us brings us joy and how we can apply that to our movements, how we can apply that to justice and liberation efforts, um, how we can apply that to like our teaching and education. And so for me, that kind of led me into what future work I'd like to do is really kind of starting to looking at rewilding parenting um, and what it looks like to mean to rewild and grow wild little ones who are already inherently wild for sure. Um, rewilding pedagogies, we're in a place where we don't have a nature school or forest school or these back to the land schools. And um, there's some sadness on that. And how can we continue to create an opportunity for our little one to do this amongst uh, their peers and, and a place of learning this in community? And then of each of those essays that I touched on in each of those chapters, there was uh, an, an indigenous uh, grandmother, an indigenous woman who generally led those campaigns. And I've got to, the privilege of really working with a lot of amazing indigenous um grandmothers in this project um, and how do I elevate their voices moving forward um, and capture their voices in a way that they don't usually write things down but they carry so much wisdom and an example of this is last week and me and my little one got to go on a prayer walk uh, here in Lake Superior with the Anishinaabeg an annual prayer walk they do and um, it was really powerful and meaningful to be there and be with the water and carrying my little one on my back and holding the eagle staff, look over the copper pail of the water. And how do I continue to give back to them and elevate their voices? And finally, um, Joanna Macy and her work that reconnects always comes back to gratitude. We start from a place of gratitude. And so I wanna also end with a place of gratitude. Um, Gratitude to the Anishinaabeg and the experience from last weekend and being on their homelands, um, to my ancestors who were featured in several of these essays for all the teachings that happened 
um, to the elders, to Joanna and Dawn, um, to Kenneth Mead and Robert Jensen, some people who were very influential to me in the very early days of this project and helping me keep me on track. Uh, to four leggeds, I have three uh, dogs now, a 16 year old elder and two one year old puppies, uh, Shepsky puppies, and they're very wild, feral beings. And so they teach me so much. Grateful to them. Grateful to my little child. And also, to we have a second one coming in March. Some people might not know that. So, an announcement there. Our, our pack is growing rapidly. Um, and so, for all the teachings of the little ones. And then finally, um, to my wife, Taylor, who's on this call, um, who's been very influential in my work, who does amazing work, follow her. She's the one who puts most of the amazing things out in the world. I'm just there to support her and um, appreciate all the support she gave me on this project. Um, and finally, to all my relations, to the elements, to the mountains, to the snow, uh, so there's all the teachings I got um, in those years in the backcountry coming into this project because so I really helped, felt like they helped guide me and ground me and are leading me moving forward. So thank you. Wow, Michael, that's really wonderful. Such an amazing work you've done. I was so thrilled today and honored, Joanna, that you would join us for this. And I mm -hmm. think before Janine and uh, and Michelle and I start uh, doing our piece, that it would be really um, lovely if you could say a few words. Because it's such a great thing you've helped bring forth here, among all the other wonderful things you've brought forth. We got to unmute you. Can you unmute? I need. I need to. Um, there you go. You're all unmuted. also uh, find my voice because I I moved so deeply. What you have done, Michael, Lynn, Wellman, is such a gift to our species to our world, the uh, courage and uh, ornery kind of originality <laughs> <laughs> displayed and your love for life and your fearlessness uh, evident in your uh, walking out of into what our uh, culture, our consumer culture has deprived us of personally and both in relationship and activities that you had the courage to listen to what you want. Mm. And you let that uh, deep root grounded imagination declare itself to you. So I'm, uh, I'm moved so deeply and so glad to be around while you demonstrate, mm -hmm. uh, shine a light into the darkness around us. There is so much hopelessness. There's so much uh, denial and, um, and uh, going nuts with our distrust of each other. And almost every part of what you shared with us has healing in it mm. of the great moral disarray that we find ourselves in. And I want to thank your wife too. Mm -hmm. She must be fantastic. <laughs> and your kid and bless your others as is evident there's a lot of tears of gratitude in my voice mm. thanks for this thanks for keeping going thanks for daring to look at what you don't know yet mm. and let what you don't know 
inform you and bring you yet wider to see it. Oh, that's it's I can't. I I have to admit that I haven't read your dissertation and I can't wait to do that. And that I um, bless you already for what just from hearing this. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I'll wait till uh, later first. I mean, for right now, I'll just do ask my question. A few, they're all small, very tiny. You mentioned, but I could say now the dual power. What did you mean by that? Mm. Yeah. Um, I, I don't have offhand the person who that's coined from, um, but it does come from this tradition of looking outside of state power and how we can develop systems um, where we don't rely on big government, we don't rely on um, state actors or corporations um, to help us when times get tough. Um, and so one example I use in my dissertation is around uh, hospitals and uh, the birthing of our child and, and starting to recreate traditions of doulas and, and midwives and birth workers and having knowledge and um, plants and, and knowledge in these traditional uh, ways of knowing so that we can lessen our dependency on systems as they, they start to collapse or as they um, are no longer to offer their services uh, to people outside of maybe the elites or those in powers. And so creating yeah. those in a communal way um, so that, um, you know, in these times of disaster and collapse that we can lean on each other uh, and in a way of solidarity and not in charity or, or waiting for someone to come rescue and save us. Yes, now I can see that this would be a great help in our denial of collapse. Mm -hmm. I just listened to a full day of wonderful discussion of climate change sponsored by the New York Times based out here in San Francisco. There was not one mention that I heard of that word collapse. And I hear it all the time. You know, I, at what serves me as grassroots. <laughs> right. So how to, how to, for us all to look at with the kind of moral imagination that you've displayed uh, as at collapse as an open door to reclaiming our humanity and our ingenuity, our ancestors' ancestral skills and our future uh, right to live, right to exist. Yeah, we have so much going for us and I hope that you're, some version of your work will make it into a um, paperback mm. that people can stick into their backpack. <laughs> that would be a dream of mine. I, I always remember what you said about building a library of paper books so that when our um, systems of electronics go down or we have these issues like I had today with my presentation, that people might have it on their backpacks, like you said, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank I'm you very so touched much, that Joanna. you're here. Thank you so much, Joanna. Joanna, it's just such a privilege you, you were here to carry on your long history of service. Thank you so much for being here and for taking part in this. You're such a big part in his writing and his work. So it's wonderful. Yeah, it, it buoys me greatly. Uh -huh. That's yeah. <laughs> that I, that yeah. the, uh, I, that I find that I can be that that the uh, ache and vision that pushed me onward has found uh, legs, <laughs> strong legs. <laughs> so. Um, Michelle, why don't you carry on? Thank you. 
Thank you, Mike, for such a wonderful presentation and for your work and for the beautiful storytelling that you do in the dissertation. I'm also mm -hmm. excited for you to share more of these stories um, with the world and just more widely. And I think that the, the weaving together that you do of the different movements and thinking um, and your own personal transformation is a very compelling way to bring people into connection um, with the work. And um, I know that we're short on time. And so I'll, I'll ask a really brief question, um, which is uh, something that you and I have talked a lot about over uh, the years. And just the, uh, I appreciate the way that you subtly bring in different forms of ecofeminist thinking throughout the piece and that you discuss uh, the relationship between masculinity and different forms of masculinity and rewilding and healing and uh, the work of ecological resistance. And uh, I saw, I, I hear you saying at the end here, your commitment to uh, raising up the voices and being in support of indigenous grandmothers and, yeah. um, and others. And I just want to give you the opportunity to concretize that a little bit and ask you, you know, who have you been thinking with in terms of ecofeminist futures and current work? And who are there any stories that you want to share or any uh, thinkers or doers who you'd like to highlight in this moment? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I feel like in these stories and people who read the stories will pull out different um, women and grandmothers that I, I had worked with through the years. Um, and unfortunately, maybe outside of a, a few, there's there's very few whose words have been put into um, like paperback form, both because I feel like uh, indigenous peoples tend to operate more within a uh, oral framework um, as well as opposed to a, maybe a written framework a, as well as um, marginalization and just uh, their voices not being elevated very often. So Winona LeDuc and uh, the women uh, at the Stop Line 3 campaign were, were very influential in my time there. Um, I'm also cautious about speaking to them and sharing their voices too often because I've had um, more than a few mention them not wanting to be seen as leaders in the movements um, for fear of being targeted, for um, for fear of being like elevated on a pedestal and wanting to be more horizontalism. Um, I think my proudest moment around that in this dissertation was actually uh, the last uh, Northern California permaculture convergence that I attended. And each year I applied to do this defending the sacred uh, panel that would at the intersection of resistance and reskilling and resilience. Um, and the final year I was given the okay and was able to co-organize where I had an indigenous grandmother from the lands I was living at the time, the Nisanan out of the uh, Tahoe Basin um, as well as um, a woman from the campaign I'd been currently been on the run for salmon, uh, the women went to, um, as well as uh, a friend's mother who runs a direct action network um, that some of us might be familiar with and I won't name right now, um, on a panel. Uh, and I was really excited to be able to organize that. And it got premiered at the uh, Saturday afternoon keynote slot. Um, and my friend who I actually met during the 10 day uh, Joanna Macy intensive, so many weavings of people through that, uh, moderated the panel um, and asked me to be on the panel. And so I got to sit on that panel with these other women in a way that I, I felt very out of place. It was very edgy for me. And I didn't, I don't know, I didn't want to be in that limelight with them, but it was very beautiful. and. It was very empowering and it really helped me like lean into that experience. So I know that might not be exactly what you're looking for in the terms of names and theories, um, but I feel like throughout this dissertation, there's a 
a fine line there because of some of the edginess of some of these things, like even on the murdered and missing indigenous women that I talked based on. Um, and then finally, like, you know, locally, um, the woman I mentioned, Amy Cree Dunn. Um, um, here we have a Center for Native American Studies. That's one of the oldest uh, centers for Native American Studies. Um, and um, she's been a very, like, wonderful local uh, educator to come in and learn from. And her voice is very strong, and she speaks from a place of resistance and collapse. And so it's been... Um, just someone really wonderful to align with here locally. Thanks to both of you. So Janine. Oh, well, it's so wonderful to be here and I'm uh, zooming in from outside of Boulder, Colorado, the uh, ancestral lands of the Ute, Arapaho and Cheyenne. And uh, congratulations, Michael. I, um, yeah, I, uh, reading your dissertation, it is such a beautiful uh, work and really emotional uh, reading it. There's so many stories and I had to set aside lots of um, kind of sit times to read it because it wasn't the type of dissertation that you can um, just digest and mm -hmm. sit with for a long period of time because the stories are so um, emotional and intense and the realities and you just do such a um, beautiful job with it. And hands down, you have the most uh, beautiful personal statement of a dissertation I've ever read. So I would echo um, what both Joanna and Michelle said in terms of, I hope you get your work out there and, um, other ways. I know within the um, dissertation you talked about hoping that uh, someone would pick up your work in one of the camps and read it. And so I would definitely encourage you to get a, like a more um, kind of zine version that goes through the um, framing of Joanna's work and then your um, three R's and bring all that together. And then I keep having a vision of you publishing your work through like AK Press with all the stories and it would just be the perfect piece. And then in terms of questions, um, I guess my one question is so hard to kind of formulate it, but in reading it, and I guess first to name, when I first met you, I think you had just maybe come back from Standing Rock or I'm not exactly sure what was going on, but when you were outlining everything that you plan to do for your dissertation. I was, I said, there's no way, there's no way you're gonna be able to do this. And especially the field activism, I said, that sounds, you know, um, maddening. And um, I guess it was maybe a two year period of going to all of these different um, activist camps and doing all of these holding actions and just, it's just beautiful. And then I appreciate how much you name within the work and then particularly at the end of kind of the um, unsustainability of this and the stories of so many of the people that you bring and um, kind of the even the hardships of that lifestyle of people that are doing it um, you know full time throughout the years and even seasonally and even needing places to live and so um, you start your work with a lot around the movement of movements. And I know the work is really specific for kind of the inner group of activists and these movements of movements. But I wonder in terms of reflecting now and going forth, do you feel like uh, there's a greater leverage point and opening up some of these ideas to a community beyond the intended community that you address? Because I guess my point is that it feels too big to hold. And I wonder what your reflections are on that now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for the beautiful reflection. It's really wonderful to hear. Um, and it was very maddening to do all those. <laughs> um, yeah. And also just 
you know, the, the transparency of the summer with the concussion and the post-concussion syndrome and then the brain fog and stuff that I've been struggling with. I actually have a neurology appointment this week. So to try to do all the intersections of the weaving at that late stage in the state I was, was really hard to actually bring it all together at the end. Um, I was like so close and also just like just getting over that hump was really challenging. So I do appreciate the, just the reflection. And yeah, this, uh, your question is actually something Don and I have like labored over so much in this, um, really the last year, but especially in the, the final months, um, I did want this to be more focused in the people within the movement itself. And one of the things that came to me from my time in that intensive when I was reflecting on my notes with Joanna um, was about systems theory, about preaching to the choir. And, um, and so I really tried to keep it honed in for this dissertation. Um, but I'd like to see it get to much bigger audiences and, and even get you know, to the place like Don and I were discussing um, when we look at it within our own fan, friends and family network is I've had a lot of family move into the more like Christian fundamentalism and a lot of family like going to storming the Capitol and stuff. And so it's been very personal for me. And, and that really just that question of like, how big do we get and how far do we go and how big do we expend our energies? And especially when it's um, so personal, right? Like the familial level and how important it is to bridge those gaps and to try to rebuild family and community. Um, and I'm hoping that others can get involved in that work beyond me. Um, part of like trying to write this through a less academic lingo is because of coming from a blue collared upbringing and being one of the first people in my family on my dad's side, I'm the first person to attend a four year university. And so I'd like to see more voices um, from the people who are experiencing the day to day, be able to digest this work in ways that are meaningful for them and possibly not have to apply it to some sort of rewilding or reskilling, um, but to find moments of deep nature connection, of coming back into their bodies, of maybe opening up some conversations that are challenging or edgy. Uh, and that's where I'd like to see the work go into the future. Thank you, Janine. That's very nice. Um, I've really worked hard to just ask you one question. <laughs> I could have endless conversation with you because of our long journey. Um, but I guess what stands out for me is the most crucial thing. Um, Joy Harjo just published a book um, with the Yale University Press on why I write. Um, so she, for those of you who don't know her, she's a, uh, one of the early people in the American Indian movement who um, for about 50 years has been writing poetry out of her experiences of the great sadness and tragedies of the Native Americans. And she talks at one place about sacred language. And she says what sacred language is meaning bringing your whole being into the, the room. And for me, the, the, the piece that seems really hope, necessary to integrate for you as you go forward is your fatherhood. Because despite all of the conflictions around the world about diversity, the big thing that persists is patriarchy. Um, so the kind of taking hold of this lovely uh, event in your life of being a father of one and now two um, seems so important that that gets integrated with your uh, sense of social change. Yeah. I'd like you to comment on that. Mm. Yeah. And this is something we grappled with together. Um, and part of it, I feel like goes back to Janine's comment that I, I did so much work going to so many uh, frontline campaigns and so much movements that made this far too complex that I really felt that it was important to give value and service to what I did and to complete that project. Mm -hmm. 
And at the same time, towards the end of that and the closure of that, um, we had our, we got pregnant, we had our child, moved into fatherhood and life has completely changed. And so I felt like I was living in a bit of two worlds of completing this chapter of activism in a way and moving into the chapter of parenting. And um, I didn't know exactly how to write those two stories together and give um, the justice that was needed to the work that I had done. But I feel like what I've been moving towards and doing, and, and I feel like I alluded to this a bit in, in the presentation, was like how much excitement I have towards moving into the place of the identity of fatherhood and, and teaching the little ones and being out there um, in that embodied place with my child and, and moving with them. Because in all honesty, for a period of this, I wasn't able to be fully present with my kid because I was... I was the topics I was working with were so heavy and were consuming so much of me. And I feel like it is most highlighted by, um, I guess a month ago or so when I sent you all my dissertation and clicked that send button and let that go and felt some of that weight off, off my shoulders. Um, my little one, Ayan had, had told me, he's like, daddy, I'm really happy you're done writing your book so you can play with me again. And I was like, me too. And it brought tears to my eyes. And, and just in this past month, the amount of time we've had together and we went on our first, um, the two of us on our first camping trip last weekend together and um, really leaning into that next phase is really important for me now. Okay. Thanks, Michael. So um, we're gonna spend 15 minutes uh, with open questions from anybody who wants to and then close it and then um, the committee will go and make its judgments after that. So I guess the easiest way is if you uh, do that little button that says hand, if you want to speak to Michael, and I will call on, on you. You all know where that little hand is down there under the... It's under it? reactions. It's under reactions, yeah. Yeah. If I'm not seeing, if I'm not seeing one, you can remind me. Oh, I, see, I see Adams down there. Adams, where is that? Oh, Adam, there you are. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll, can you unmute him, Michael? There, good. Hey, Mike, Mud, Taylor, hey. Michelle. It's great to see everyone's faces. Oh wow, it's amazing to be part of this. It's been a long time in the coming, uh, in the making. Mike and I have worked together for. Seven years, I was just reflecting. We met at an action camp blocking a mine in Utah uh, all those years ago. And I just wanted to, to kind of give testament to the fact that a lot that Mike talks about in his dissertation was a lived practice. I mean, he makes some sometimes his recommendations, what we need to work towards. But this kind of, you know, bringing a slow, smooth approach to a very manic activist atmosphere, one of which I have been part of and, and, and one of which we have worked to uh, figure out together, um, you know, has been a lived reality that Mike has brought. And I just wanted to, there's so many aspects I like of the dissertation. Um, I've been reading it in, in chapter reviews. Um, as he goes along and, and just checking out like the conclusion and stuff this morning. Um, I wanted to pose a question uh, because I thought maybe we could bring some collective energy to it. What do you see uh, going forward as new potential uh, flashpoints to in, in land defense uh, for us to be aware of? Like where can be, we be looking um, across the horizon in your own bioregional zone. Uh, I know there's a lot going on that you're a part of uh, or beyond. And so what can we kind of look towards? Mm. Thanks, Adam. 
Yeah, full disclosure, while Adam's not a character in any of my stories, Adam is present in many of those stories. So um, of anyone at CIS, Adam has more familiarity uh, with my work uh, outside of maybe my wife. Um, and yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know if I have an answer. I feel like one of the things that I learned is the importance of rooting into place. And since we moved back here, I'm originally from the Great Lakes bioregion. Um, uh, and starting a family here and being closer to our families and stuff and, and planning on this being like the place that we're living from moving forward. Uh, my care for the land, whether that's land tending and mending or um, learning about the seasonality of uh, harvest or or the extractivism campaigns that are happening have taken on a, a bit of new meaning. And I, and I feel like one of the things that was identified in that movement of movements, um, which really spawned into the anti or alter globalization movement was this uh, summit hopping or peak experience hopping. That is pretty true of a lot of activism today in my experience. Um, and so what is it like for people to start rooting more into what's happening locally in their place? Um, for example, here really close to um, both where I'm living currently and the, the land that we're attending, um, there's a proposed spaceport rocket launch site that's happening. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, recently um, got asked to be on the board of uh, that campaign. Um, and, and part of what we're trying to do is build a coalition or alliance with the other campaigns that are happening in the realm of uh, obviously not other spaceports or rockets because that's pretty niche, but uh, the sulfide mining or shutting down line five or this development of industrial wind turbines and, and starting to recognize that they're all the same sort of project that Joanna kind of mentioned around the consumer capitalism mindset. And, and so how do we get strength in numbers and, and start moving away from our, our very niche field that is frontline activism and start moving more towards um, building movements that have some mass to them. Thanks, Adam. Laura. Hey, Michael. It's really, really nice to see your synthesis of all your work over the last many years, and um, glad to glad to be here for it. Um, I was curious to hear some of your thoughts and. Um, I feel like you've kind of touched on it a little bit and um, Joanna kind of touched on it as well. But just in thinking about kind of these times we're in and the like despair that young people have about the future and um, the, you know, many things to be sad and grieving about um, and thinking about, you know, the students that I teach and like working with young people. And so like, I guess what is, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on like a balance or like a way of approaching, like being honest and real and like critical about these issues, but also like, how do we hold on to like hope or how do we like instill, um, you know, motivation in young people to feel like they can make change? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that one. Um... This is a question I'm absolutely grappling with all the time. Um, so full disclosure, I met Laura, uh, same time I think I met Lily in our, maybe one of our first classes at CIS. And so I've been along on Laura's journey for her PhD as well. Um, and I feel like my views have changed on this over time. I feel like I was more into the like, give them 
all the information, whether they can bear it or not, mode more early. And I feel like the more I've learned about the body and trauma and nervous system regulation, that my views have been changing over time. And, and how do we learn to still be completely truthful, but titrate that experience so that each person is able to kind of sip at the fire hose, um, but also continuing to push people into their challenge zone. Uh, and so where's that edge between our challenge zone and our panic zone where we start to freeze and shut down and go into paralysis versus really pushing our edges and expanding our comfort zone and being able to live in a more uncomfortable world. Uh, and I don't know if there's a prescription for that, but how do we figure out where that edge is for each person? And, and I feel each, each person can, can learn about where that edge is for themselves through um, these embodiment exercises, living from a place of more trauma-informed activism, um, starting to become more into the present and now and living, living here, which some of those things like cis bots and bird language and stuff can do. Um, and then finally, I'll conclude with, uh, I was asked to actually come to teach. Uh, Laura now lives, um, I guess we're not in the same watershed, but we're very close to each other, Midwest. Um, and Laura teaches at a university in Wisconsin and invited us to come to her land ethics class, an experiential uh, place-based class with her students um, last semester where they did sugar bushing and making maple syrup and um we did medicine making with them and turning some of the invasive honey suckle into medicine, which is actually really good for the symptoms of COVID. Um, and so changing this narrative around invasive, um, but also that experience with your students working with acorns. I felt like there was a, a bit of joy in the classroom, a bit of twinkle in the eyes of using their hands of actually working and turning something like an acorn, which I've actually done with Lily, um, and turning it into something that's very delicious and tastes amazing and they got to eat and consume and, and just recognizing that they did that. And I, I feel like there is an empowerment and and using our hands and our hand consciousness to, to do. So. And I was just reading my reviews from the class and many of my students said, you definitely have to bring Michael and Taylor back next year. So. Oh, good. <laughs> so the last question goes to Mary. I'll unmute you here. There. Mary, are you there? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, I, I wasn't asking a question. I was just applauding the analysis of becoming more resilient as opposed to sinking into the trauma. Mm -hmm. So I, I I thought that that was really well put, and um, I was delighted to to listen to the whole thing. I couldn't be on camera the whole time. I apologize for that. Okay. So I think Thank the last you. word goes to Joanna. <laughs> you said you had a bunch of questions. You get to ask one more as we close. Joanna, you're going to have to unmute yourself. There you go. Yeah. Well, I think that you've worked so very hard on this. And I didn't know about the concussion. Mm. I had one this year that's been really devilish to work with. And um, so I'm, uh, I know you are. Um, uh, I would like to know uh, from you how you are going to uh, embody your uh, gratitude for that you express so beautifully at the end and in order to <clears throat> um, discover ways that you can help us all um, not get worn out saving the world. Mm. And ways to to tap in with every question that you've asked, uh, asking how we can uh, repair at the very time that we uh, turn to fill in the huge gap 
that we find ourselves in in our from our lifestyle uh, a world wrecking lifestyle which includes the pace that we get sucked into <clears throat> and the needs uh, i'd like to hear from you how you are going to uh, embody the lessons and and especially in relation to gratitude and pace yeah, no, thank you idea. thank you joanna what a <laughs> what an important question in these times and something that i'll just be completely transparent of, has struggled with um adam mentioned a thing slow is smooth uh, smooth is fast and it's a mantra that comes from mountaineering and it's about finding smoothness um and i'm definitely not the most graceful person um and I'm actually finding that with the concussion and some of the post-concussion symptoms, I'm really having to push through to finish this document in a timely fashion was not conducive to my mental health in that way. And so I've been struggling. Um, and so I feel like this is gonna be different for everyone. And I feel like that's part of why I mentioned the joy making. Um, I know for my wife, it's dance. Uh, for me, I've been finding lots of joy and and playing soccer and being out there in the field in a way that is bringing me laughter and levity and all these things that I've really been lacking um, while being in local community here in my town and meeting more people. Um, but beyond that, for me, it's really about getting back to being in the outdoors. Um, and it seems like every time I'm able to get outside this morning, we're we're having this winter storm here and the, the lake is raging in a way we might have some record breaking waves today. And I, I took the dogs down there and stood for like 10 minutes right on the shore and was having like the spray hitting me and the crashing and um, just feeling it in my body. Um, and for me, that's so important to come back to the gratitude to remember the earth is continuing to do what the earth does um even as it's, it's struggling as well uh, and so one of the paradoxes or hypocrisies i feel like this year as i'm doing all this writing about rewilding and reskilling and stuff and this is in in the years since i've been starting to do all this work the least i've done for wild crafting and harvesting and medicine making and preserving foods and and so I'm really looking forward to be able to get back onto the land and use my hands and and be hiking in the woods and searching out for the mushrooms and smelling the dirts and um because for me that's where I'm really finding my gratitude it's I I, I feel like that's the place that no matter how things bad things get that it helps just co-regulate my nervous system in a way that allows me to continue on. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. <laughs> and doesn't that sound wonderful for each one of us? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and even when we, I said today, like this beautiful wall of plants is actually plastic behind me. So right, it's part of this. Uh, um, yeah, I know down here. I'm at, I'm at a co-working space, but in the fierceness of the weather, I carry this little plant down here with me. Oh, so nice. <laughs> I have a little plant and a little rock from the shores. So something to keep me grounded through this process. Thank you so much, Michael, for this uh, great light during this very dark time. And thank you all for being here, especially Joanna. It's wonderful to have your presence here and for all of you to support this wonderful work. So we're, um, Michelle and Janine and I are going to retire to see if he deserves to pass. <laughs> and we'll, uh, I guess we'll say goodbye to everybody. Is that right, Lily, while we go do our deliberations? Or um, usually uh, when I've sat in on dissertations, the committee goes and deliberates and everybody kind of waits and hangs out and says, oh, you know, just says hi and stuff. Couple and, hours, you know? and then we get to hear the decision but okay. yeah it depends on how long you think you're gonna have to fight it out for it be several hours i don't know oh no <laughs> <laughs> why don't you put us in the breakout room and then we'll come i'll back. put you in the breakout room and we'll see what happens how about that that sounds good okay you should you should the three of you should see that invitation now and then you can yeah. leave the room whenever you want all right michael really 
really solid recovery from that. Oh my God. Throw the computer out the window moment. That was really great. And I'm so sorry again that we, I mean, I just was like, oh, that's a beautiful image to start his presentation on. <laughs> Thank you to Taylor for messaging me and saying, I don't think this is it, but really well done. It was, that was so beautiful. Um, yeah, I felt like, thank you. I really appreciate that reflection. I really tried to like reground it. It was just obviously destabilizing. And then the time, you know, it was just like yeah. so hard to, but of course, like, I, I just like, of course that was going to happen. So yeah, you were, you really, yeah, you, you demonstrated the res resilience and, and well, yeah. Well, thank um, you for being here too and holding that for me. It's like, I see all these faces and I've known all of you or some of you that I can see at the moment so long. And yeah, when some of these stories that come up, I'm like, oh yeah, Lily was there for acorn processing or things. Yeah. And um, that means a lot to me to have you holding the space today. Yeah. It's a lot. It means a lot for me to be. I think we are, our first semesters were at the same time. I was a master's and you're a PhD and we had a couple classes together with Laura yeah. and Sam Mickey was here earlier. He I taught. Saw that. Yeah. In one of our yeah. classes together. So yeah, it's a really big deal to see, you know, dear friends who have known for that entire journey crossing the finish line in a really good way, you know? Yeah. I appreciate that so much. So, yeah. So Michael, thank you very much. Hello, Michael. Hello. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you so much. I, I have been with Oh Father Samuel, you're you've cut out. I can't hear you. Yeah, I'm on the on the road. Yeah, just to <laughs> Michael for the work done. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Mike, I got to go, but great work. Congratulations, buddy. Uh, thanks, Maddie D. I appreciate it. Good to see you. Yeah, I love you. Love you too. Hey, Michael, Taylor. This is such an incredible oh, moment. Oh. Like Joanna said in the beginning, um, you couldn't come to words because you were so emotional, Joanna. I, I was following that and tracking that in my own body, feeling the praxis of your work and feeling the presence of both of you in the world, like how deeply profound that is and how we desperately need you right now, both of you. You know, I feel like there's this quality that you have cultivated between each other and with your parenting and another baby coming through that has so much quality of like you sprinkle stardust in the, in, in the darkest times. And I, I carry that in my heart and know that you will both continue to do that. It makes me feel like the world is a better place, you know, that I, that I don't have to be so devastated. And like you were asking, you know, like, what do we do in such hard times? Well, we look to you as our leaders and our guides and our elders now. You've got to take, I mean, you are, you, you've been taking the front line for a long time, but I'm, I'm so deeply touched by your work and I, I want to, I never really read students' dissertations because they're too long and they're too intense, you know, but like this, you got to send me your dissertation, Michael. So, so proud of you. Congratulations. Oh, so sweet to see you here, Ishtar. I didn't, I, I haven't looked across at all the faces in a while. Um, I'll definitely send it to you. Um, you might be happy to know that our class, the Wild Rites of Passage course, is is um, touched on and featured actually in in this dissertation. So that's beautiful. I'm touched. You're another one of these faces and voices and people who uh, that was well in my second year of school. So you know, mm -hmm. seven years ago or something that we continuing the threads. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Mm. Love it. Congratulations. <laughs> it's wonderful to think about how much that you're the tools, the concepts and the tools that you're giving people in this work and in your life uh, will uh, certainly live on after us. Mm -hmm. And it's how it's so great, to, you know, being in my 90s now. <laughs> wow. 
and I'm so grateful to be around to hear the advances that you've what you've done with Matt issues that matter to us all so much. Here I we the group has come back. I, I have Thank to say, you. Joanna, I was so happy to see you here today. I always feel so lonely way out here on the edge of the 90s. <laughs> so so happy to have you along with me. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. Uh, we're all happy with you, Michael. Congratulations, you passed. Uh, and each each of us wants to say a, a parting word to you. So, um, Michelle, you get to go first because you initiated this. Um, well, congratulations, first of all. I hope that you have a wonderful, restful, celebratory period over the next many months and um, that you can really lean into appreciating yourself and um, and Taylor and everyone who has supported you in this process, um, human and non-human, and that uh, you let that rest, but then continue this good work of bridging the three areas and the three movements that you're talking about and uh, not, I understand as a parent and as a parent of, with about a, a decade more of um, kiddo hanging, um, how um, many wonderful things there are to do in life. And I appreciate the, the different elements that you're bringing together and think that you can continue to do all of this work and all of this um, good creating of the path and walking of the path with others as a parent as you, as you move forward. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you so much, Michelle. Janine. Oh, great. And I also just wanted to say hi to uh, Joanna. When I saw your face and heard your voice, it just made me wanted to cry for joy. Um, and Michael, yeah, I, yeah. At one point I would love to have a follow-up, just one-on-one -on -one dialogue with you because there's just so many rich bits in your um, dissertation. And I think the only um, piece I would say, which is, I guess a big piece, and I know it's not something anyone would probably have time to do, but uh, since you work so richly and have so much um, guidance for these um, activist community, it would be really interesting to at some point get feedback from um, the people that you worked with and the stories and for them to really look at the model that you're presenting and uh, see how it kind of maps onto their experiences. But I know that would be, I mean, that would be another dissertation, but, or maybe someone else will um, carry the torch and do another um, project with it. But it's just been such an honor to witness what you're doing and yeah, just really honor and just tearful as well. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, Janine. I think Taylor, you should have a chance to say something. <laughs> <laughs> Since you're really an intimate part of this thing. <laughs> oh well, I, I mean, I get to hang out with them for the whole day, so I got lots to say. Um, well, first, yeah, <laughs> yay, and um, yeah, I hope that I've been crying the whole time over here over at this coffee shop. So excuse me if it's loud, but. Um, yeah, I hope that you, first and foremost, are just able to receive the bounty of your work, which is this moment and everyone's reflections that are so heartfelt and honest um, of what you've been up to. And it's been our entire relationship. I don't know Michael not doing this work. And so um, we've got a whole we've got a whole world cracking open ahead of us. Um, and through it, I have also been able to know you and witness you become who you are um, and earn all of those gray beard hairs and <laughs> earn all of those those moments and earn this. Um, so I just really hope that you're receiving it um, and drinking it in so that it can settle um, as just who you are, not what you're up to. Um, and really let that be true as you move through the world. Um, because that's how I know you. This is who you are. It's not just something you've been up to. Um, and 
yeah, I'm excited for it to get into the back pockets of the people, friends, activists, co-conspirators, allies, accomplices that we have loved and who our presence in those frontline places has been an attempt to be of service to their care. And that this is like a gift backwards in time to them to say, you know, we really, really respect their efforts and the efforts that we put together and want to create a better world alongside them, not in spite of them, but inside of them. Um, and that's, that's what this offering feels like is how do we get it into their back pocket so that they get to be a better world, not just fighting for one. Um, and so I'm excited to support you in that next leg whenever it's time working with publishers and trying to get it yeah. shrunken down and in pockets, um, in the pockets of people who, who want to live in this world um, so that they have the resources, the resource that is your voice. So I love you, I'm so proud of you. Mm. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Hey. I want to say a final word of thanks. Well, I want to say full full disclosure that thank you, Taylor, for that. Uh, and um, yeah, I met Taylor like two months after I started this PhD. So literally the whole time I've been doing this project, um, that's all she has known. So we are in the midst of uh, some of that as it's leaving, like trying to figure out what is next and who we are outside of this project. So I just really appreciate her support and her guidance and all of her teachings um, and being the mama to these babies. So thank you. So Michael, I just want to end with uh, thanking you for something that's kind of in the background, which is um, I was very moved by your family, by the struggles they're all in. Uh, and it gave me some um, compassion for people I could get really angry about and hate. <laughs> and I'm really grateful that I don't feel that way and that you had a major part in opening the compassion for all the struggles that people are going to that end up in these mad ways of resolving things that we know are not very helpful. So thank you for that. Thank you for the journey that we've gone on together. Yeah, together. Yeah. Okay, so let's depart into our various paths. It was a joy to be with you all today. Thank you. You get, to keep, so your, you get to keep your mug, Michael, so you can now yeah. show them your mug. Oh yeah, I was drinking out of it. Now it's you get like, to keep it. It's dark. Can you read it's it? Doc it says it's doctor, actually. Oh. <laughs> That's amazing. I was going to have to take it if this didn't work out. So. <laughs> That's so great. Yay. Congratulations. Bravo. Thank you, everybody, for coming and taking your time out of your day to be here with me. It means a lot to me to have so many of you show up. Congratulations. Good job. Congratulations. Dr. Wellman, congratulations. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Good to see you. Love you. Bye, bye Don. Good to see you. Bye, Janine. Bye, bye. Bye, 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 bye. Joanna. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>